Welcome to the Doctor's Corner with Dr. Klein and Janelle Elgoway. Good evening and welcome to the Doctor's Corner. I'm your host, Janelle Elgoway, and we are here with Dr. Klein. How are you doing this tonight, Dr. Klein? I'm just dandy. Great. Tonight's topic is fear of addiction. If anyone would like to call in with a question this evening, you can do so at 415-915-2291. You can also listen to tonight's show either at www.callnation.com or you can listen and chat live with our audience on the YouTube channel, The Doctor's Corner. So, Dr. Klein, tonight we are talking about fear of addiction phobia. Um, can you please tell us what that means and how you came up with this term? Well, uh, so many, I, I was making a list of the fallout that's occurred since the CDC guidelines in March of 2016. And apparently our Board of Registration in Medicine here in North Carolina has done a survey of doctors, which nobody else seems to do. And 43% of doctors in the state have stopped prescribing opiates. They have stopped prescribing pain medicine. When 20% of um, visits to the doctor's office are about pain, Obviously, not everybody needs the maximum painkiller, the opiates, but still, that's a very important part of the practice. So, what's behind this? This is a terrible thing. Right. So, what is behind it? For doctors to stop prescribing pain medicine, I'm just horrified. And then we hear other things. Mm -hmm. We hear the legislature passing a law limiting the prescription of pain medicines to five days. So what's the reasoning behind that? What is it? What's, what's the reasoning behind the doctors refusing to prescribe? Mm -hmm. um, I have a patient in California, and we just found out that in California it's illegal to, um, for me to prescribe an opiate in California, where all other drugs are fine. Generally, I can prescribe any drug I want, including opiates in all the states. Why did California pass a law that they didn't want out of state doctors' prescriptions? So the list goes on. Why are people being denied medications? Why are people sitting after staying awake for two days and going to their doctor and the doctor says, well, we're going to cut you 50%. Not, well, here's what we're going to do, Barbara, and here's why we're doing Nope, we're just going to cut you 50%. So what has happened to reason? And reason goes out the window when you have fear. And the fear that people have, the basic fear that people have that's driving all the negative things for pain patients is fear of addiction. Mm -hmm. It's a phobia. And now I just happen to have my little uh, uh, iPhone here that has my whole life on it. And here's a little dictionary. <clears throat> a phobia is a persistent, irrational fear of a specific object, activity, or situation that leads to a compelling desire to avoid it. A phobia is actually in the DSM-5, which is the book of psychiatric diagnoses. So this really borders on a mental illness because where is the reason? Where is critical thinking? It's been thrown out the window because of the definition of phobia. Compelling desire to avoid it. Irrational fear. So is the fear of addiction irrational? Yes, it is. You know, I have a, um, a patient who um, runs a um, air conditioning and heating business. And one of his clients uh, found out he was taking pain medicine. And she took her purse into the other room. 
And then she spoke to him and said, you know, eventually you're going to get addicted. That's fear of addiction phobia. Mm -hmm. He's not going to get addicted. Nobody becomes addicted once they're on pain medicines. Nobody. It's never been reported. But yet, the fear of addiction is driving behavior. And it's driving behavior that's harmful and sometimes lethal for pain patients. So when I write articles and other people write articles that this is wrong, blah, 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 people that have an irrational fear are not going to read those. So when you have an irrational fear, what do you do? So I've been reading about, and not finished reading yet, of what happened during the McCarthy era in 1950, 1955. There was an irrational fear of communists because the Russians now had the bomb. When I was in school, we practiced uh, drop and tuck, duck uh, where we got under our desks and we put our hands over our head that this was going to shield us from an atomic attack. So what was that based on? That was based on fear of atomic attack. And then that bled over into, since there are a bunch of commies building these bombs, then we become afraid of communists. And it was really severe. As you know, there were actresses and actresses and writers and directors barred from working in Hollywood for 10, 12, 14 years, blackballed, no work, because they were associated with communists. Not communists themselves, associated with. So you see, in the situation of pain patients, it's because opioids, opiates, are associated with addiction. So you cannot separate the two. They are inextricably tied together. To understand why See, people write me and I do it myself. Why would a doctor do this to somebody? We have examples of doctors taking people off medicine and they're in so much pain they take their own lives. Good God. I mean, what could be worse? So that's why we're going to talk about fear of addiction, phobia, because I think once we understand that, we can start to tell people, whether they like it or not, that the reason you're doing this is because you have fear of addiction. Let's face it. You're afraid you're going to become addicted, or your neighbor will become addicted and kill you, or your children will become addicted. And that's a very, very fearful thing mm -hmm. for people. So what we do is we say, well, but just like I just said, no one will ever become addicted who's already on the medicine. and But people who are suffering from this phobia just look at you like, so what? In other words, part of the definition of irrational fear is it suspends reason. It becomes unreasonable. So the question is, and maybe we'd like to hear from people, how do you deal with a severe phobia like this when people are basically not willing to listen. Right. Um, we have a, a quick call we're going to take. A caller from area code 914. What is your name and what's your question for Dr. Klein? Yeah, my name is Heather Wolf, and uh, I'm with the Coalition for the Terminally Ill, Disabled, and Elderly, and I myself am living with severe CRPS and spinal cord injury, and I take opioids myself when I need them, and I am not addicted. And I want to thank you for having this show and for discussing that, and I wanted to kind of talk to how do you confront somebody that's engaged in a narrative that's driven by fear, and I feel that the only way is to approach their fearful situation with love. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. In other words, um, 
uh, you know, this is kind of the basis of religions, you know. When people are afraid, you're brought into the fold, and you're surrounded by loving people. And when that happens, then maybe that starts to drop this barrier. People are, like, walking around, uh, you know, with this barrier around them, not listening. I guess one of the things that, um, that I have tried to do is to say, look, we have a problem, but I want you to at least listen. You do not have to respond right now because sometimes this needs to wash over you. But I want you just to listen to the arguments. Now, they will reject the arguments initially. That's the way it works when you, um, when you don't believe something or you believe in something different. But what you're asking for is trust me, which is a, a love, you know. In other words, trust me. I'm not going to hurt you. And I don't have any interest in what I'm saying, like me. You know, I'm not being paid by drug companies or, I, you know, I'm, I don't have a grant, you know. And that's the nice thing about religious groups because they don't have alternate, alternate agendas. It's just their fellowship and, and belonging to a parish. I actually spoke to um, two or three uh, pastors and, and I spoke to one rabbi about maybe we could get this love thing going, that we could start trying to understand addiction. See, people don't want to do that when they have chronic pain, but we have to. These two are joined at the hip, and nothing is going to change for chronic pain patients or patients with painful disease, which is my preferred term, until we understand what's going on with the addiction because all of the rest of this is being driven by a fear of addiction. So. When we sit around in uh, legislators' offices and stuff, their eyes just start drooping, and all they're thinking about, as one fellow told me, who was a veteran U.S. representative of 10 terms, 20 years, he said, but Dr. Klein, you don't go to all these funerals. I do. So it's fear of addiction. He's gone to a couple of funerals, and he feels terrible, and some young kid you know, in high school has died of a heroin overdose. So then this gets magnified into a broad scale nationwide fear of addiction phobia. Everybody becomes so phobic, they just want to avoid the problem. And that's 43% of doctors in North Carolina have quit prescribing pain medicine. That's really bad. But why? See, we keep asking ourselves why. But I like your idea of... Um, you know, figuring out ways to do this. I remember the great um, 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 talks that were had in in, in uh, South Africa after Nelson Mandela came back to be president. They had truth and reconciliation. So they had these big round tables and they sat around and the old police officers, the white guys would come in and the, and the uh, natives, black folks would come in, they would sit around the table and they would talk in a normal tone of voice, they had some rules about what it was like to be a police officer and the fear that they had about the population of black folks, which was 90%. So whenever fear gets into it, um, during the uh, 1954 Brown versus Board of Education, there was a lot of fear of African Americans and that was because there were some very nasty attacks on white people back in the 1850s where white people were butchered by black folks. And that wasn't too smart. You know, Martin Luther King said, this is why you can't have violent. But what they did is kind of a, they sat around tables uh, in school districts and they just looked each other in the eye. And they finally decided, you know, the black residents and the white residents, all they wanted was the same thing. They wanted a decent education for their kids, and they were poor whites and poor black folks. So they were afraid of one another. The black folks were afraid the white people would string them up, which, of course, there was a history of that, but it was getting less and less by the time of the... But by sitting around and talking about it, so it would be very nice to have um, legislators or people who have fear of addiction phobia who are 
doing things that are harmful to the um, population of people with severe painful disease. Well, aren't most of them doing that right now, though? I mean, do they not? Don't they have fear of addiction? They don't really know what's going on? Well, that's true. I think that, you know, fear is kind of a funny thing, you know. Um, uh, you really kind of have to say, are you, what are you afraid of? I always wanted to ask people who are passing laws in the government, what are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. And see if people would actually say that. But you have to be in a loving, trustful situation to carry on that conversation. So the caller is correct. You can't just accost people and um, say things like, why do you believe in God? You know, why are you afraid of addiction? You, mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way. You know, you have to have formal sit-downs, truth and reconciliation. It was a great idea. Mm. Thank you, Heather, for calling in. Uh, we have another caller. Uh, welcome to the Doctor's Corner. What's your question for Dr. Klein? Hi, um, it's Julie in New York City. I actually have to listen on the phone because the live stream isn't working. So I do have always have something to say, but... Um, I had to call the number to listen to the show tonight. Okay. I don't know what's going on, my problem, or... But I'd also like to comment on fear, because I was just listening to Dr. Klein talking about fear. And I have a rare disease that sounds funny. And I remember when I first heard it, it scared me. And when I told people I had it, they were like, okay, feel better, and you never heard from them again. Mm. Fear comes in different forms, especially with disease. The rarer, the stranger it sounds, and the, the first thing they think, is it contagious? Am I going to get it? Is, <laughs> yeah. Am I going to get it? And I've had met, it is a deal breaker. I call it the S word, sarcoidosis. Uh -huh. Soon as a man hears it, gone, ghosted. But friends, too. They don't even bother to look it up because they can't pronounce it, and it scares them. And they say, as I said, okay, feel better, and then you never hear from them again. They're afraid of catching it. They're afraid of catching your bad luck. They're afraid of your limitations, and they're afraid you're going you're gonna to ask them for money. That is another, another fear. It's true because they think, oh, you're sick. You're going to start a GoFundMe. You're going to be dependent. You're going to need rides. They don't want it. And I don't know if addiction is looked at so discriminative. It, they discriminate against addiction, but also disease. And I feel that that is happening now. Yeah, that's, that, a, good, well, that's a good point. Um, addiction is, uh, some people view it as a disease because it's unpredictable. I think that when people yeah, have it, fears of black folks or the Jewish population or... Um, immigrants or people that are Muslim faith, it's because they don't know what's going on and therefore they think it's unpredictable. You know, suddenly a person, yeah. uh, you know, uh, um, you know, who's who's a Muslim, I mean, are they carrying an AK-47 under their long robe? You know, um, so, yeah, so fear of a disease, that's a very interesting comment because um, it's it's kind of fear of things you don't know. You know what school teachers do when they have a kid with cerebral palsy or something? Mm -hmm. They on the very first day they bring the kid in with a cerebral palsy and they, they have the kid explain to the other kids what's going on. And then um, oh okay, then all the kids are fine. You know until they know. know what's going on. You know what's the matter with this kid? And children are so wonderful sure because you just give them a little explanation and they're fine. <laughs> it's true, though, it, but with a mature disease, when it starts when you're thir in your early 30s and you go from healthy to sick, they, it scares people. It scares away spouses. It scares away friends. And they just had a rare disease hearing um, in the Senate last week, and Lamar, Senator Lamar Alexander left. To sign another opiate bill, they had the great scientific mind speaking about the troubles and strife of having rare diseases, and he just left. Yeah. And no, only one question was asked. I would have had 20. 
I don't understand. I mean, they're afraid of even talking about it. They had to for the hearing, but I mean, I understood it, but you can tell it went through one ear and out the other to the senators. They just didn't understand what the doctors were saying. There's, they don't want to look it up. They can't be bothered. And that's the problem. And that's part of fear, too. They don't know the erratic things that sound strange. They don't want to know about it, and they don't, you know, they, they run away. Or they pretend they're listening, and then they'll forget about it. Yeah, I see, that's the, that's the phobia. You see, it's an irrational fear, and so the earmuffs are on, and they're not going to listen. Um, but Martin Luther King said that um, hatred comes from fear, and fear comes from separation. You know, uh, when I grew up, um, the only person of, of African descent was the maid you know, in the house, and she was a wonderful person, and, uh, you know, she was basically a family member, but who was taking care of her family, you know, and so we don't, we don't get close enough to the things that we fear, and that's how the truth and reconciliation worked in South Africa, I mean, people that were carrying guns and shooting at black folks, and black folks that were rioting sat at the same table, so it, it must be that rather than writing a paper or appearing in Congress, that maybe it needs to start more informally. And this is where people of the cloth can help out. Because people of the cloth know about fears. And they know that people have fears of dying, they have fears of becoming sick, and there are ways to deal with it in the churches, in the shuls, and in the mosques. So I kind of go back to thinking that maybe we would have moderators who were of the cloth, and then we would sit down and have pain patients sitting there showing that they, you know, weren't carrying weapons, and start a dialogue. What happens without a moderator is, and I've done this, you know, I've gone to visit legislators in Washington with pain patients. And so we just sit there and, and the patient talks and then I talk and nothing happens it's because it's not moderated. See, the skill of moderators is that they're, they're neutral. You know, they're, um, they don't care about the issue. All they care about is seeing that a dialogue takes place. So when legislators sit down and they pass these laws, first they declare an emergency. And when they do that, that cuts off all public debate. Mm -hmm. If you have an emergency, then you just go ahead and sit down in the back rooms and light up the cigars and pass the law. And they did that in this state, passing a law that you couldn't get a prescription for more than five days. They did not consult me. They did not consult doctors that I know of. I mean, that's an example of fear of addiction phobia. Uh, do something, they say. And when people say, we got to do something, that usually means they don't know what to do. Right. Uh, we have they no don't know what to do because they're afraid. We have another so, call, a uh, caller from area code 980. What is your name and what's your question? Hey, um, this is Jessica. Hi, Jess. And I have a question, and it's kind of <clears throat> a little bit of a first statement. But I, there is one fear that I have noticed amongst my family and friends when it comes to addiction and opiates, but also all other drugs. And it's something that I experienced personally. I have family members who are addicted. I am scared instantly, and you automatically get that feeling that, unfortunately, that the person who's addicted is going to steal from you, even though that this may be a family member that you have, well, you've grown up with all your life, or that you've helped raise. You automatically, once you even hear the word drugs, addiction, you start literally guarding your silver and stuff like that when they come to your home. And this the way that society has kind of made it to be. How do you get past that? Well, that's really How not we fear. Yeah, that's that? not fear of addiction. That's the realities of addiction. So in other words, if, 
if you've got somebody in your family that's stealing, that's you're you're not afraid of them. You're just right. being on guard. You know, it's like uh, people are afraid of for, people are afraid of dogs. You know, but if you actually have a vicious dog, that's a different story. You know, you're that's a perfectly reasonable thing to be wary. You're going to become wary and defensive and on guard. That's a little different than um, a kind of diffuse, nebulous fear. You know. Um, you know, I'm afraid of people right. who have a disease. You know, I'm afraid of. But if you really yeah. had somebody in your family and they had some disease that was harmful to the rest of the family, can't think of one offhand. But if that were the case, then it's really not fear. You're you're really dealing with a real situation. So. I completely agree with you. I really do. It's just that that's the way it seems like society has already associated it. When they think of addiction and fear of addiction, that is their fear. That's what well, I'm trying to say. Not that there is a, you know what I mean? No. That there is an actual fear. Well, the word, the word gets out. It. Yeah. The word gets yeah. out that, that you, here you've got somebody in your family that's sneaking around stealing from you and stuff. And then everybody else becomes afraid that, you know, they're going to be harmed by addicts when they don't realize that the addicts really are very rare. And if we, you see, this is why addiction and pain treatment are tied together. If we would just treat the addiction, it's a real disease. Nobody wants to hear that. Mm -hmm. And if you ask people, is addiction, oh, of course it's a disease. Uh, Well, how about we do some medical treatment? Like what? Well, let's give them uh, a low-dose controlled opiates. Oh, my God, you're just going to make more addicts. Don't, I don't want to hear it. And you see, that's uh, an irrational fear. Um, it's without fact or reason. Instead of sitting down, and so that legislator who's talking like that should sit down with a moderator and addicts. How many times do you see addicts interviewed? How many articles are written about addicts talking? No, they write articles about addicts laying in the street with photos of needles. That's fear of addiction phobia. To put a newspaper article together and show all these needles lying on the ground. Why don't they show a mother? Why don't they show a mother in a park with her kids? They don't want to associate it. You know, they don't, it's just like they were really human, human, humanize it. That's the best way that I can describe it because they do it a lot here in Charlotte. <laughs> they say really do. They stop thinking of those who are addicted as people. They think of them more so as do, an actual disease. Okay, uh, how, how do, okay it's, a, it's a fear, so how do we change that? How do we deal with people with fear? Like what I'm asking. I don't know the answer. You know, I would like to study the McCarthy era and find out what finally stopped it. We're not afraid of communists anymore. So it it died. The fear died. That particular phobia of communists died. But how did it die? It took, I know, at least 15 years. But what happened to make that? And maybe we need to learn the mechanisms. How about the fear of AIDS when it first came out? Right. Fear of crack cocaine. The United States government passed laws to put crack cocaine, African Americans usually, in prison for 20 years in Wall Street or out snorting cocaine every day at lunch. You know, so what was the fear about? It wasn't about cocaine. The fear was uh, black folks losing control. See, that's fear of addiction. The unknown, the unpredictable. And I think if more people heard um, folks with addiction disease, uh, with opiate addiction disease, and see that they're not monsters and that they have children and families and jobs, and that this is a real live disease. Thank you, Jess, for calling in. Uh, Caller from area code 914. Uh, What's your name and what's your question? Hi, is this, uh, this is Heather Wolf again. Oh, hi, Heather. I'm actually, hi. Um, I just wanted to actually, wanted to notify you that the Facebook streaming isn't working properly and you do have to call in to, to hear the show right now. Oh, we don't, uh, um, we don't go off of Facebook. We go off of YouTube and the website. 
www.connation.com. Oh. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, that's um, okay. And I, I kind of also feel that uh, because fear itself is almost in a type of an addictive behavior that has to do with um, your autonomic system and the, the way that that is set, you're basically um, can become addicted to being in a state of fear that to answer maybe the question with a question is maybe the MacArthur, McCarthy era fear mongering of and, and phobia of communism went away because we changed our focus and became fearful of something else. Yeah, could be. So I'm just curious about, um, I'm looking always at what's actually helping to promulgate these uh, phobia campaigns that are in the media, because I believe there's a concerted effort to put this fear-mongering out there in many different media outlets, because I understand how grassroots astroturfing firms work in Washington, because I've been an advocate for many years. And there are uh, pharmaceutical companies are trying to pull cheap, effective uh, drugs off of the market because they don't make money on those. So they see the cheap generics as a, um, you know, something that's cutting into potential market share for creating new drugs that are not opioid-based, but they're painkillers. So if we could, you know, they, I believe, are probably behind pushing a lot of this false narrative and they do so by utilizing what they call those astroturfing firms. They call them grassroots firms in Washington, where they'll do a multi-pronged attack uh, as part of a guerrilla marketing campaign to get this phony, non-science-based, fear-based message out for their agenda. And that's something that they're very good at, and they go and they prepackage how it's going to work and it's and it they know exactly how it works and they know it it does work to push fear and to do that narrative that is not truthful but it has an agenda and an objective that's harming us in a big way and I don't really know how how to possibly confront that knowing that the false narrative has you know, sources of power behind it that are very powerful. Yeah, you really can't take on the drug companies. Um, they're, they're way too powerful. But part of the problem is fear of addiction uh, is raising the prices of pain medicine by making them seem to be criminal. So in other words, if you're taking opiates, you're a criminal and you're going to eventually addict and die and you're going to, you're going to do something bad to me and you're going to do something bad to my... Uh, my children because you're going to spread addiction to me. So then that jacks up the prices. And yes, people are taking advantage. It's called healthcare profiteering. And it happens quite a bit. And it certainly happens at drug companies. So yeah, so I agree with you. Thanks. Dr. Klein, I, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to what people are saying and, and questions that people are asking. And the main thing we keep I keep getting is... Um, Okay, so the focus is on overdose, and that's what, you know, the CDC is focusing on, um, the politicians, um, the mainstream media, regular people, that's how they see this. So what if we start, at, like what you said, I think that's a great idea of going in and starting to get people that are, that d deal with uh, addiction, and get people that are, um, th that deal with, you know, uh, intractable pain and pain patients but how can we get them onto more of mainstream media stuff because nobody wants to listen well you know people have a, a sensational interest if you've got um, addicts on television you're going to get plenty of people watching and I think probably the way to do this is just you know thinking off the mm -hmm. off the uh, cuff it would be nice to have TV programs with both Right. Addicted people and people with painful disease because they share 
in taking this group of medicines that nobody else takes. Yeah, and they both have to, correct? And I mean, they both have to. Right. Um, they both have. Uh, they both look the same in the office. Both are desperate for more medicine. One is desperate because they have a disease, and the other person is desperate because they want their pain relieved, and they've had it relieved, and now looking forward to it coming back is much worse than having it all along. You know, so yeah, I think if if they sat together and people had a chance to ask questions, you know, this is the moderator idea. So a mm -hmm. lot of these shows on, um, you know, Fox News and the the View, like the five, they kind of all yeah or whatever, they all are asking questions. So you see, you kind of have a little bit of a moderator um, type thing and bring out these questions. What are what are people concerned about? You know, what are you really afraid of? Right. See, that's that's a question. If people are willing to talk, but you've got to get in that that trusting situation that the caller talked about first. You can't just bust into a senator's office and say, "What are you afraid of? Why are you passing this stupid law?" You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah there's got to be a little bit of a process because of the intensity of the phobia and being afraid of. Uh, we hear stories all the time. As soon as uh, your neighbor finds out you're taking opiates, they don't want to talk to you and they won't let their children play with your children. I've heard that happen. Uh, you know, people are shunned. So Martin Luther King had it right. That's separation. People don't know what's going on with people who are in distress and who are different and have something that's unpredictable or thought to be unpredictable. I think the lady with the sarcoidosis, um, uh, I think that's what the disease was, that, oh, she said it, you know, are people going to start asking me for money? You know, people have these unpredictable things. So you got to do like the kid in the first grade and the CP kid, you know, mm -hmm. say, hey, you know, this is what this disease is. And this is what addiction disease is. And now let's get over it and let's move because and you start dropping a few facts, you know, come on, we've, we've been at this 100 years now, and guess what? Doesn't appear to have worked. So maybe we need a new solution. People can kind of buy into that idea, too. I mean, people will admit that this has not worked. Right. All the, all the things the DEA has done, all the hassles that I have to go through to write prescriptions because the federal police have these rules about, you know, everything has to be on paper. I can't call in a prescription. I can't fax one in because... The DEA's fear of addiction has led to irrational behavior where they think, gee whiz, um, you know, if if uh, if you don't call the pharmacist up, that's going to control addiction. Well, like how? See, when you get to that step, then that's when the irrationality of the phobia comes in. If you ask the DEA people who pass these regulations, why'd you do this? Okay. They'll say to control addiction. And then you say back, it sounds like you have a phobia without facts. What are the facts? Have you shown that you cut down on addiction by doctors not being able to call in prescriptions to the pharmacists? And I also feel like we've almost been playing their game in the sense of that, you know, they're throwing, uh, like, uh, I'm, uh, this is mainstream media, and, um, like, the CDC and these, um, you know, nonprofits or somebody like Prop coming up, um, they throw out these myths, these fears, um, and then everybody kind of like is doing everything to uh, disprove it, but you can't really because, you know, they're coming out with it. And, and it's just so big. How do we get past all of that? Is there a way or no? Well, it's uh, dealing is first of all is recognizing that what's going on really is a fear of addiction phobia. This mm -hmm. is behind 99% of what's going on. So at least that's an explanation as opposed to why are these people doing this? How are they you know, passing why laws? Are they saying this? Like because once laws are passed, they're passed. I mean, it's very they hard are, to yeah. yeah. So how can they do that um, without knowing full factual truth research well you see they it, the legislature operates on fear of addiction so mm -hmm. they have these secret meetings they they don't have any public hearings they quick pass the law oh this is an emergency see that's all fear of addiction wow during the mccarthy era they actually had laws about 
cons- communist conspiracy, it was called. So, like, if uh, you and I went to a meeting and somebody was presenting the life history of uh, Karl Marx mm. to an audience that had nothing to do with it, oh, we would be associated with communists and therefore a conspiracy. People were locked up. They were jailed under this law, which eventually was, you know, they eventually did get rid of that law. Mm. Um, and there were several other laws, which I'm currently looking into. But the McCarthy era was really a lot worse than we realized uh, looking back, you know, 70 years. Uh, it was bad. I mean, people were rounded up just like they're rounding up doctors. Mm-hmm. You know, they've been rounding up doctors for over 100 years. And I think knowing a little bit of the history, when you, when you present a lot of information to somebody who's phobic, there may be one or two things they grab onto that they think, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense. When that happens, the door is opened for more dialogue, but it really should be moderated. Yeah. Moderated by professionals who know how to do this. And the easiest ones are folks in the local uh, churches and and synagogues. And, and um, you know, it's funny because all the religions are, are all, the, all the people of the cloth are kind of trained this way. You know, they're trained in resolution of problems and how to be an independent moderator. And, you know, that's what the basis of uh, marital, marriage therapy is, you know, is having a moderator and then trying to deal with myths and truths and stuff and relationships. Well, I, I think they could help a lot. And um, um, I know there's a lot of uh, churches that are supportive of people with addiction disease mm-hmm. and some that aren't. But, you know, no matter what, the role of the pastors and, and rabbis is neutral when it comes to being moderators. They're kind of like we've got this we've got this great pool of professional moderators. I mean, you can also hire professional moderators. Right. You know, the uh, the obvious ones are the labor negotiation um, moderators that come in and they try to look at both sides and they remain neutral. And that's what we really need. We, ne- we need neutral people. We've got fanatics and we've got um, people that have strong opinions on, on both sides, but there's nobody really in the middle right. moderating all this. Uh, we have another call. Caller from area code 254. What is your name and what's your question for, for Dr. Klein? <clears throat> Hi, yes, this is Murtis Morgan. Um, I, I'm i nervous, obviously, but um, I have an appointment um, next Friday with a pain clinic I've been going to for two years. Um, never had any problems with addiction-type things. And what they're going to do is they are going to have me see their addiction specialist, which is somebody new they've brought into their office, and also a counselor. And what they want to do is take me off of a medication. I recently was in the hospital for two weeks, and I almost died um, from an an infection that I received due to trying to get off of opiates or pain medications and use a pain pump. So, you know, I've done everything for the last 20 years, and the pain pump was like my final thing. Um, And it caused me to almost die. So... I will not, nothing else will be stuck in my body, put in my body. Were you put on the pain pump because the oral medicine, pain medicines failed? Well, they, they were not giving me, Uh, they, what they were doing, they, they thought that I was, um, I guess, lying about them not working. They weren't giving me enough. They, I had a pump. I, I, I was on all kinds. I'm when I'm talking, they had me on methadone. Cymbalta, lithium, you name it. I was on it at one point in my life to where I couldn't even hardly function because I was so messed up on all of that stuff. So I weaned myself off of it, decided to go on the pain pump because I had tried everything else. Now, some of it worked. I was working at one point, so it worked enough for me to be able to, to function in my position that I had at the time. Um, so I decided, let me do the pump to get off of this pain medication and not have these issues anymore had the pain pump since 2011, um, and it never worked. It never worked. I continued to tell them, look, I don't feel any pain relief. Instead of doing a dye test to, you know, easily test it to see if it was working, they never did that. 
um, they said, well, the pump, you know, they put the little thing on the pump itself was working, yes, but when they went in five years later to do the, the battery change, the tubing was kinked. So the medication had been getting out of a tiny little hole, wasn't you getting know, into my uh, intrathecal space. You know, we, we hear these stories a lot, and you've received negligent care. And you should talk right. to your lawyer. You need to get out of the pain clinic. You need to file complaints with the board okay. of registration in medicine. Um, find out if the okay. clinic is, find out if the clinic itself is licensed. Sometimes the whole clinic is licensed okay. by um, Department of Public Health. You've been a victim of negligent care, and it's interesting that it's still based on fear of addiction, but it's secondary because people are afraid of addiction. Now, healthcare profiteers can come into the picture and not get their hands slapped because mm-hmm. of the overall fear of addiction. You know, the fact that you weren't run up to proper doses of oral medication, and I say in my experience is opiates do work if you give enough. So you see what they were right. the, what they were angling for, uh, and I'm just guessing is to get a pump in you because they make tons of money servicing the pump right. every month, giving the medicines. It, it's mm-hmm. just, you know, it's very lucrative. Mm-hmm. So um, you got right. talked into it, and, and it's just negligence in itself to put a pump in somebody that doesn't work. Um, so I would, talk right. to a, I would talk to a lawyer. you got to get out of there, um, you know, and try to find a physician. It's hard. As I said, in North Carolina, the, you know, 45% have quit practicing. And so that makes it more difficult for the 60% because they want to take a certain number of pain patients, but they can't double their practice, you know, to make up for it. I mean, uh, the doctors who are still prescribing will have to double their patients to make up for the, yeah. um, what do we say, lily livers? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the doctors who have just t- <laughs> thrown in the towel and yeah, there's a lot of oh, the DEA is going to get me, you know. Well, right, I hear that some, all the time, do, and I talk do something about too. it, you wuss. You know, well, that's I mean, what I said. I said if you can't do this damn job, get a different one. Go walk right. dogs or something. You know, if <laughs> you can't stand up for us, go <laughs> go. Really, you know, it's, it's walk really, dogs or something. Yeah, it's really sad. Um, so, but you know, people need to. I, speak I know. This. Speak up in an adult way to doctors and say, right. "Why aren't you? Why aren't you following this, the FDA guidelines? They say there's no upper limit. Yeah, that's why, why, a good point. They're the legally mandated ones. What are you doing? You know, why right? Are, I've uh, done that why? too. I, I've done that too. And, they, okay. and it's like they think okay. they they override me. They think they. That's why I'm going to. You know, I have information that you and Janelle have both provided me that I'm going to take with me. And the the pump started in a hospital. Um, I am now in a pain clinic because the hospital wants to put the pumps in you, right. but they don't want to take care of you once you get them. So they send you outside. Yeah. Um, now, if a hospital is involved, you can file a complaint with whoever licenses the hospital. And that probably is the Department of uh, Public Health in your state. And you can file complaints there as well. Um, you know, if we don't file complaints, and they just continue to take advantage of people who are trapped in the pain clinic who can't get any other medication, it's going to continue. You know, so people have got to start filing complaints. It's hard. It's civilly disobedient. They're going to try to kick you out of the clinic. But remember this. If they kick you out of the clinic, then you've got another complaint to file. They cannot just dump you. Good point. Thanks for calling in, Mertis. Uh, we have another call. Caller from area code 808. What's your name and what's your question for Dr. Klein? Hi, my name's Cherise. Hi, Cherise. Speaking of the, uh, hi, you know, speaking of the pain pump, um, I've had uh, epidural injections. I went through the stimulator, spinal stimulator implant. Four surgeries later, had it removed. Um, in three weeks, I'm due to get the pain pump also um and it seems like not, not until no no you put your foot down you say not until full fda approved titration to the point of pain relief is done first 
And if you're if you're wondering mm. if you're wondering about the FDA and their titration techniques and their um, lack of having a maximal dose, why don't you give them a call? Or why don't you check with a board of registration in medicine and ask them whether or not you have to follow the FDA guidelines because they are federal mm. regulations and they are not voluntary. They are mandated. The CDC, voluntary, not mandated. And why are you following? That? Doesn't that sound risky to you, doctor? If you ever ended up in court and you mm -hmm. said you were following these voluntary guidelines and ignoring the federally mandated laws and regulations from the FDA, doctor, would you like to explain to the jury why you did that? Are you aware of the exactly. fact that the FDA runs the show? The FDA's labeling is the law of the land for prescription drugs, and there's nothing in there about limiting the dose. Exactly. That's why I don't understand why the CDC, they're in charge of diseases. You know, this could all be prevented. I would have had any of these injections, one which caused peripheral neuropathy. I have yeah. CRPS. Yeah, um, don't don't, you know, don't go to these and, people. And and my doctor yeah. won't give me more than, well, I was at, at 180 MME, but he won't give me any more unless I get the pain pump. No, I, oh, oh I, no, no, I, my no. My feet are not controlled. I can't walk without it. Okay, now that needs to go to the so, board of registration and possibly the district attorney's office because um, that's extortion. Extortion is making people pay money for something that protects them. So in other words, if you buy a pain pump uh, and pay for a pain pump, then maybe you can have some pain medicines later. That's extortion. And that um, definitely needs to be reported to the Board of Registration of Medicine. And by the way, everybody's shy mm -hmm. about getting into trouble, but you can write in the complaint, I prefer not to have my name released. Now, the board may decide mm -hmm. that you'll, you'll, you won't get a serious thing but you know what every time they get a letter believe me they log it in you know now they got a hundred okay. complaints about these uh, pain pumps going on um, you know if a bunch of people got together uh, like you with this information you might file a complaint with the inspector general for the CDC okay. and say look how much money is being spent on things that don't work very often, I did a Twitter poll. Those stimulators only work 25% of the time. The pumps work about half the time. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the That's inject exactly opposite of what I was told. Was op and they're just lying to you. Um, and you see, if see, they've got you uh, uh, under control because if you start complaining, they'll just get rid of you. But then that is a form of complaint to the Board of Registration for Abandonment. Um, you can file a complaint for purposeful under-treatment for no medical reason. And certainly when they are mm -hmm. trying to extort you in the purchasing uh, pumps and stimulators, and I know there's uh, one place in a major city with a large pain clinic, and they're pushing these stimulators because they get 50 grand for them. Exactly. This is one company, too. I haven't been given an option, and I know there's several. So. Yeah, no, yeah, not, exactly. no, according to the FDA and according to best medical practice, and start raising your voice a little, um, you know, the FDA yeah. is in charge, and none of these medicines that I'm on have an FDA limit. They are to be titrated, which means slowly increased, uh, watching for side effects until they work. It doesn't matter how many milligrams. And that, not only that, but the CDC 90 milligram cutoff that started all this doesn't even apply to chronic pain. It only applies to the very first time you take an opiate. We call that being opiate naive. That's when you can get dizzy. So then, why are these why are these doctors scared? Why are they getting why are they getting arrested? Why are they shutting down pain management clinics in huge well, numbers? What's, and well, Why it's are all, doctors so scared? Yeah, well, it's fear of addiction is behind all of it. The fear of addiction is driving the police, mm -hmm. driving the boards of registration. The police are now arresting doctors for prescribing too much. 
prescribing too much. Now, wait a minute. The FDA said you prescribe whatever you want. How can it be too much? You know, we got these um, prescription drug monitoring programs, uh, you know, spying on doctors and patients. And, and, they're, and they're publishing the MME, which is how much medicine you're taking. Well, uh, wait a minute. The FDA says it doesn't matter how much medicine you're taking. So, you know, you can fight back with that, and that is a very valid argument. That's not a flimsy argument. We have an FDA. It's the only agency mandated for regulation of prescription drugs and across-the-counter drugs. That's it. They're the law. They have regulations. The CDC has no regulations. They have recommendations. I mean, the CDC could make recommendations on how to build an aircraft carrier if they wanted. You can make recommendations about anything, but they have no they have no authority. There's no standing. And what they did is they took advantage of fear of addiction. That's what they took advantage of. And there are people who wrote these regulations who are afraid of addiction. Dr. Clinton, we had a question. Um, somebody wanted to know if NARCS care is in place simply because they are trying to find physicians who are pre overprescribing, or are they truly there because they're looking for overdose probability, probability rate? Well, the, um, they're not looking for overdoses. Um, it's a police system. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, this will help you with your practice. Uh-huh, right. Um, it's a police system to catch doctor shoppers. In the state of, in the state of um, North Carolina, doctor shopping is illegal if you haven't told the doctor that you're going to other doctors. Is that still able to happen, though, with all the uh, systems in place between your pharmacy uh, well, they, they're spending $1.3 million, and last year, the North Carolina caught five people. Five. Uh, five. <laughs> doctor shopping. I mean... That's I, the only reason it's in place. Fear of addiction. Because, my God, a doctor shopper wow. is a dope fiend. Is there any place where people can go to find all this information that we just spoke about tonight, just about, like, for patients? Because, obviously, this is going to take a while to make any, implement any type of change. So, is it, what you spoke about, um, what people can do, um, how to talk to their doctors and stuff, is there any place where people can go to find all that information in one place? Well, I'm working on it. Are you? Okay, good. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're going to try to put stuff out. You know, my job is to put stuff out and then what people do with it, it's up to them. Uh, but I'm a physician and a scientist and I have a PhD, which has taught me how to be a little more scientific mm -hmm. and I have no alternate agendas. So I just try to put this information together along with my experience and put it out there and people can do with it what they want. Yeah. But I like the, um, you know, having this show tonight has made me realize more that we need to think about moderators. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've gone to Washington and you have too, Janelle, where we sat there and we talked to people. We're talking at them. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and, they're, and they're making notes. That's, that's not the way it's going to work. We really need to sit down and, with a moderator and say, okay, here's my question for you. You know, this is the old Asian having a middleman for business. Right. It really works better. In other words, if we were with a senator and there was maybe just one of his staff would act as a moderator, I could say through the moderator, what is it that you're afraid of? Yeah. And they could ask a question back in, in the same genre. What are you going to do about all these kids dying that we read about in the newspaper and, and the representative has to go to these funerals? In other words, see, that's how you get a dialogue started. And I don't know, maybe when we go visit people, we should suggest that format. In other words, it would require two staffers. That would One be a would, great idea. would act as a moderator, and the other staffer would act as a representative for the legislator. Mm -hmm. And then here we are, because it, what we're doing isn't working. You know, so we need to figure out ways to make things work. Um, and one little tip, uh, if you're taking things to doctors that you find on the web, you know, internet and stuff, mail them in. Don't come into the office with this pile of stuff. Here, doctor, read this. You know, that'll just irritate them. 
Right. Uh, but if you send it in the mail or drop it by the clinic with a little post-it on it, this is for your information. Uh, we've done that with palliative care. Doctors don't know what palliative care is. They think it has to do with hospice. They can't get it straight. And so uh, we wrote a little thing that's on uh, on Medium about explaining, but you've got to give it to the doctors ahead of time. And we found that works. Mm -hmm. If you just go in there with the thing and say, here's about palliative care. Do you think I qualify? No, they don't. They don't get it. If they read the whole paper, which they're more likely to do if it comes in the mail, because then it just goes into the pile on the desk of things to look at. You know? uh, so, we, ha we have uh, two more calls, if you don't mind. Um, sure. All right, caller from area code 980. Uh, what's your name and what's your question? Hey, it's Jessica. Oh Hi, Jessica. I'm sorry about my voice. That's okay. Hey, so um, there's one thing that I did find out by talking through the MC Med Board, one of the people there. So when you look at your NARS care report, or even if you go to look at um, just like if you think you've been flagged, and the, the people say, oh, well, you've seen so many doctors within you know, 12 months or six months. You know, if you go to the emergency room, every doctor that you see at that emergency room is counted as a separate doctor. So, for example, I had to go there because I had a, re a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst that just kept rupturing every month. And... I, they wouldn't let me take it out or anything, but I would go there and I wasn't, I didn't have any pain medicine. I was in so much pain. I mean, every month it would rupture. So when I was looking at my report, I saw that there was those ER doctors. And then I saw two doctors from the same primary care clinic. And they were listed as separate doctors. Well, you know, we've got but to attack this. It. Yeah, this, this whole system is rotten from the core. They're, they're giving people scores on um, probability of overdosing based on the CDC data from addicts. Narc's care should be only for addicts, not for people in the general population. And so multiple doctors and things which they're using, um, you know, we need to get together and fight yet another fight. And this time, this is a little more obvious because this stuff is really wrong. And the state is paying a lot of money for this. These people are charlatans, and if they want to sue me, go right ahead. They're charlatans because they are taking the wrong data, and they are coming up with their own patented um, algorithms that they're not sharing with anybody. These people are charlatans. How can they do that? I, I, they, they, well, how can they do it? <clears throat> fear, fear of, of addiction, addiction phobia. <laughs> The General Assembly and, and the legislators here are getting calls. Uh, do something. Do something. But there's people dying in our communities. It's like wildfire. Yeah, and a couple kids died because their doctors didn't ask them if they ever had an opiate. And because we're so afraid of addiction, we don't treat them and they end up going to the streets for their own treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like AIDS. Just get rid of them. You know, let them, let them go die. Fear of addiction phobia is driving this whole thing. All right. We have one more caller, a caller from area code 443. What is your name and what's your question? Hi, it's Dawn. Hi, Dawn. Hi. Hi. Um, yes. I've been in pain management for 10 years, mm -hmm. and she cut my medicine in half. And the reason she said is because she don't want to lose her license. And I don't think that's what is written in my report. I'm almost positive. I haven't seen it. I'm going to request it the next time I go. But okay, now here's, give what me any here's what you can yes, do. Sir. When you call up the Board of Registration, anybody can call. Call up the Board of Registration and say, my doctor said they were going to lose their license if they didn't cut my medicine. Is that true? And guess what? It's not true. In North Carolina, they are desperately trying to uh, reassure doctors they aren't going to get into trouble. Do you know the CDC uh, recommendations have nothing in there about cutting people off? Nothing. You mean titrating? Or? No, cutting them off, lowering wow. doses. Wow. There's nothing in there about that. Fear of addiction phobia is sweeping the country where doctors have this fear, well, just, you know, because it affects you, I would call up the board of registration 
and give them her name and then ask if you should file a complaint or whether or not you can handle it informally. But she told you that she would lose her license if she did not cut your medicines. See what they say. Yeah. And then go back and tell them and say, I'll tell you something else. You know, if you try to harm me anymore, I'm going to contact my lawyer. You see, and they just don't think people are going to be that bold. I mean, what have you got to lose? They're, they're going to cut your medicine anyway. Right. You know, and not, lawyers are currently not, <laughs> not interested in taking these cases. But there was a huge lawsuit in North Carolina many years ago about failing to treat pain. So it is a uh, type of activity that could be um, sued. I mean, if you ask the doctor, oh, because they're going to take my license, and then that's not true. Then you say, well, why else are you doing it? Oh, the CDC guidelines. Oh, how about the FDA guidelines? You know about those, doctor? Those are the ones that are law. So why are you, So what other excuses do you have for harming this patient? You know, we just got to, you got to fight back. You know, it's like any other oppressive thing. You know, during the civil rights movement, people fought back peaceably. And maybe going in the doctor, jumping over their desk and strangling them is not, you know, being real nice. But, you know, be diplomatic and just say, you know, I just checked on this doctor and here's what the board says. And if you say the word board, they'll start to sweat mm -hmm. because you can't practice without a license. And if the board registration takes okay. your license away, you're, you're doomed. Don, did you have any other questions? So, so it will be calling the medical board... Uh, registration Is yes it's a, if usually if you put in the um, state and you just put in medical board it'll take you to the board they all have different names uh, Mars okay. is the board of registration in medicine but you'll find it if you just google medical board you know for your state you'll, yeah. you'll get I've the name I've called all the it. governors all them they said they can't make the doctor give me any medication I said well you sure yeah. did, did say enough to scare her to take it away so no, the governor the balance can't, here yeah the governor can't do anything about it wrong jurisdiction you need to go to the board of registration in medicine where they hold the licenses yeah. okay sir I appreciate all right thank you Don well, Dr. Klein and Connation, we're going to get going here. Uh, did you have anything else you would want to add uh, for the evening before we get going? Um, no, but no. I think we have some new ideas from people who called in. I think the idea of moderators. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of people have a lot more fears than we realized, even being afraid of people with chronic disease in addition to those who have chronic disease and take pills. Um, and... You know, we need to confront people early on, I think, like the kid in the first grade, um, not let these fears just kind of start rolling freely down the street where, you know, then they're having uh, torchlight parades carrying pitchforks. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a tough problem, but, you know, I mean, uh, African Americans in my state of North Carolina were hung from trees. Yeah. And that stopped. And it stopped because of courageous people. So you got to be a little courageous, and you got to realize that you know you're liable to be um, screwed by the pain clinics and stuff. But I'll tell you what: when people are afraid, they generally back off. But you don't know that for sure. You're taking a risk. But if they do uh, do something abrupt to you, then you got another reason to file a complaint. And the boards will listen to that kind of stuff. You can't dump patients. Yeah. It's called patient abandonment. You know, that's a biggie. Well, thank you, Dr. Klein, for educating us all on the fear of addiction this evening. And a big thank you to our audience for taking some time out of your evening to join us here at the Doctor's Corner. I'm Janelle Elgaway, and this is Dr. Klein. Signing off until next Tuesday. Have a good night. Good evening. This has been The Doctor's Corner with Dr. Klein and Janelle Elgoway. Copyright 2018. All rights reserved.